Uh, starting a new quarterly today, Rebellion and Redemption, the title of the lesson is Crisis in Heaven. Now, if you look at the third paragraph in the introduction to the quarterly, it says the following. Satan's effort to misrepresent the character of God to cause men to cherish false conception, a false conception of the Creator and thus to regard him with fear and, hatred, and hate rather than with love. His endeavors to set aside the divine law, leading the people to think themselves free from its requirements and, its persecution, and his persecution of those who dare to resist his deceptions, have been steadfastly pursued in all ages. They may be traced in the history of patriarchs, prophets, and apostles of martyrs and reformers. This is the central issue in the war. The central issue, our conception of God. How do we view him? Do we view him with love and trust? Do we view him with fear and hatred? This quote also mentions that Satan has endeavored to set aside the divine law. To lead people to think themselves free of its requirements. And I want you to think, how? How has he endeavored to do that? Well, if you look at the first paragraph in Sabbath lesson, it says the, uh, the following. And it's quoting from Book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34. The law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all intelligent beings depend upon their perfect accord with its, with its great principles of righteousness. Pause in the middle of the quote. Think, think as you read. Why? Why? are we required? Why do, does our happiness, our, for our happiness, is it required that we harmonize with its principles? What law lens are you looking for as you think about this? And looking through. Are you looking through the law lens of the way human laws work, system of rules that we impose and then we enforce with punishments? Are you looking through design law, creator who built his universe and has certain protocols upon which life is actually constructed to operate? If you're thinking level one through four moral development, looking through that imposed law lens, then you think, well, our happiness is dependent upon obedience because if we disobey, we'll get in trouble with the ruling authority and he'll have to punish us and that makes us unhappy. How much of Christianity functions at this level? We don't want to be unhappy because God will send us to hell and he'll punish us and that makes us unhappy. So our happiness is to keep him happy so he won't hurt us. Or are you thinking like one of the mature friends of God who understands God's laws, the design protocols, and that when you deviate from those designs, it's actually damaging and destructive to you, and thus you can't be happy in that state. Continuing on with the quote. God desires from all creatures the service of love. Now think that through. Just contemplate that for a moment. Service that springs from an appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in forced obedience. And to all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. What kind of law compels forces? What kind of law compels and forces? This is the kind of laws we can make. We can't build reality. We can't, we can't create time, space, matter, energy. We can't do that. So what we can do is we can make up rules. And then we can enforce them. That, and coerce. So imposed laws, the laws that created beings make. And thus if we teach God operates that way, we've taken him off his throne as creator. We're not worshiping creator anymore. We've taken him off his throne and made him no better functionally than us. If you understand how the two types of laws function, then in this very statement, we don't have to go any farther than this, you can recognize the difference between God's law and man's law. You can see the diverging split in the great controversy. So if God takes no pleasure in forced obedience, if all are granted truly genuine free will, what action on God's part is therefore excluded in the functioning of his law? What? Force. Yes, the use of power to enforce his law. <coughs> Coercive enforcement. So with this in mind, what does it mean then, putting all this together, that Satan has tried to get people to set aside the divine law and think themselves free of its requirements? How has he got them to set aside divine law? What the, well, what does the law require? Obedience. Righteousness. Righteousness. And obedience in the, in the, through the design law lens is absolutely right. So this is a few quotes. This is the, um, A New Life, page 32. 
the divine law requires us to love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves. Now, there are some texts from Scripture hopefully come to mind. If you keep the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing what is right. All law summed up in love for God and love for Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. All law hangs on this, Jesus said. Next quote, Review and Herald, March 11, 1884. This is the voice of God to you. That's quite a profound statement. This is God speaking right here. This is God's voice. My brothers and sisters who profess to keep the law of God. And here it is. That law requires that you love your neighbor as yourself. Wait a second. Uh, where's the, that law requires you do this or you do that. That was um, Review and Herald, March 11, 1884. Review and Herald, April 5, 1898. But the law requires that the soul itself be pure and the mind holy, that the thoughts and feelings may be in accordance with the standard of love and righteousness. And then Signs of the Times, February 24, 1898. Christ came to this world to live the law and represent the character of God, that the delusions which Satan had brought upon the world might be dispelled. What was his purpose in living the law? Delusions. Who's got those delusions? We do. What is a delusion? By definition, what's a delusion? Deception. Distorted reality. view of reality. A, that's exactly right. It's in psychiatric parlance defined as a fixed false belief. A fixed false belief. Okay? Is is the world fixed on a false belief about God's character and how He operates? It's a delusion. How many of our own church leaders? preach delusional material. Yes, hand somewhere. Yes. Are questions delusions? The reason I ask that question is because I think this was his demonstration in the, in the universe was for the universe. It wasn't just for us. No, are, you said are, are questions delusions? Yeah. No, question, questions are not delusions unless the questions are the rhetorical question that are really not questions or statements. But if they're actually questions that are coming from a mind that wants to differentiate truth from error and seeking to get the evidence to do so, no, they're not, they're not delusions. But they can kind of point to deception, like Satan used questions... To deceive. To deceive. Right. To the kind of, well, is that really true? You know, noticing what I said, if they're coming from a heart that really wants to discern. Yes, questions can be used to, pers to promote delusion by undermining confidence in what's true. So the law is shown to be a, a representation of God's character that man may see that he must render obedience to the law if he would become a member of the royal family, a child of the heavenly king. This law requires nothing short of perfect spiritual obedience. Now, does that scare you? Does that sound uncomfortable? Do you get all kind of tense and it's like, oh, there we go, back to it again. I was raised into this perfect spiritual... Okay, you just reverted to level one through four thinking. You're under the imposed law with system of rules that you must obey. If you were at the hospital and, and the doctor said, now, physical health requires that you be in harmony with the laws of health perfectly. If you deviate from the laws of health, you're going to get sick. Well, you're just putting so much work on me. That, that sounds horrible. Or how about this when you go to the doctor? Doc, I've got cancer. Um, it's metastasized. Um, but I only want to be 85% well. I don't want to be perfectly well. Do you want to be perfectly well? Or do you want to be 90% well? 100%. <laughs> See, when you understand design law stuff, this perfect accord or perfect harmony means restored back perfectly to God's original design. Living in harmony with how these constructed things, which is primarily about the motive of your heart, not the deed that you do. Thus Rahab, whose heart was, I'm going to sacrifice myself to protect others. I'll lay down my life for others. I'll put my life at, on the line to protect other people. Lied, but where do we find her in Hebrews? Hmm. In, and she's in the lineage of Christ and she's in the hall of faith. See, she was perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Why? She was perfect in love. But she wasn't mature in love yet. You see, she hadn't grown up to understand the differences. She didn't trust God enough to say, I can speak the truth and he can send his angel armies like he did for Elisha to throw around a barrier if he needs to. She didn't have that yet experience with him. So the law requires love. And why? Because it's the basis of life. It'd be like saying this to someone. The law of respiration requires that you breathe. And what happens if you refuse to do so? That's, that's what the law is saying. When you understand God's design law, that's all it's saying. 
So how has Satan gotten men to think they don't have to live in harmony with the law of God? You're gonna, I'm going to confuse you with this next statement. Here's the answer. By getting them to believe they have to obey the law of God. As an external device. How has, men got, how has Satan got men to think they don't have to live in harmony with the law of God? By getting them to believe they have to obey the law of God. Yes, Satan wants people to think they have to obey God's law. Only Satan replaces God's true law with his own perverted version of that law. It's not design law. It's not the principles of love. It's not how life is constructed. It's a system of imposed rules imperialistically put upon us and coercively enforced. And you better obey or else. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 prophesied that this was going to happen. A little horn power would arise and seek to change God's law. And the whole world would be infected by the wine of the, of the fornication of this beastly system. That in, and what does wine do to people? It intoxicates, confuses, right? And this wine of this doctrinal teaching has infected the entire world. And the entire world, pagan, unchristian, or Christian, still see God in this light. Isn't that directly related to the idea of, of original guilt because of the sin and that sort of thing? Seems to me... It all stems out of that kind of stuff. Right. So Steve Morris last week uh, brought an article from the Chattanooga Times Free Press, our own Chattanooga paper. Shared it with me and I read it this week and I, I'm going to share this article with you. Let you see the infection. It actually starts out sounding like, well, that's pretty good, but watch what happens. This is December 5, 2015, page E1. God isn't looking at us with an angry face. I once heard a person, badly, the pain I caused elicited an unforgettable response, eyes flashing fire, nose compressed like a spring under pressure, jaw locked, teeth grinding. It was an angry face. We've all seen the angry face at one time or another. It's nearly impossible to avoid, considering that we are bound to make somebody mad eventually. In my situation, the person I offended was no mere acquaintance, which made matters worse. Grief is compounded when we hurt someone close to us, like a spouse or parent or friend. We don't want those we love to be angry with us, and we especially don't want God to be angry with us. Have you ever been burdened with the feeling that God is looking at you with an angry face? If you're like many people, you do. God must be angry with me, or I think God is punishing me, are statements I frequently hear as pastor. Though we have been taught that God is love, many of us go on quietly believing that God is also mad. Doesn't that sound good to start with? Now watch what happens. Certainly, we deserve God's anger. Our thoughts and affections and behaviors often reveal that we prefer our own way over God's, and we know, if God cares about justice at all, that he must punish sin. Therefore, it isn't unreasonable of us to imagine a dark shadow of wrath on God's face. Our sins are many, God's judgment is certain, hell is real, and we are by nature children of wrath. And yet, what hopeful words. And yet, the Bible says, there is a way to know with absolute certainty that God is not looking at you with an angry face. How can you know? Look at the cross of Jesus. The cross wasn't merely an example of love. It was a substitutionary act of love. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Instead of turning his angry face upon us, God turned his angry face upon his son. God's eyes flashed fire, his nose compressed like a spring under pressure, and with locked jaw and clenched teeth, he poured upon Jesus the wrath we deserve. For God so loved the world. Jesus, the sinless substitute, absorbed in himself every ounce of God's anger over our sin, fully and finally. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can you believe it? No condemnation, no angry face. If you are in Christ Jesus, that is, if you are trusting in Jesus for salvation, you can be absolutely certain God is not angry with you. You, you will still grieve God and your, uh, with your sins and experience his fatherly discipline, but God will never look at you in anger. His, all his anger has been spent in Jesus. Wow. <laughs> Do you see the infection? What law is being described here? Do you see how they pigeonholed God, the creator of the universe, to operate in a system of rules like human beings make? An imperial dictator. Sin must be punished. This is evidence of the infection and how deeply it has spread through humanity. This idea that God is arbitrary, being imposes rules, inflicts punishments. Let's jump back to the introduction at our quarterly. 
And the fifth paragraph states, Yes, God has pledged to bear in himself the full responsibility for all human rebellion and to suffer the consequences for every evil we have committed. Only in this way could God restore his relationship with human race, relationships between humans, and humanity's relationship with the rest of creation. What are they saying? I'm going to try to put a positive spin here because I think there's two possible ways we can hear them. If we hear them in the best possible light, are they saying, are they trying to say that God suffers in the way a parent suffers when they see their children engaged in behaviors that injure themselves? So all human sin and evil causes God to suffer in his heart because he loves us and all sin damages and destroys that which he loves. Are they saying that? If they are, then that's a healthy way. God does suffer when he sees us injure ourselves. Or are they trying to say that all sin, all the sins ever committed by every person throughout all history are legal breaches in God's law and require legal accountability in the divine government, which means they must be punished. And thus, all the individual acts of sin ever committed were placed upon Christ and God inflicted torment and torture upon Christ to cause Christ to artificially experience the legal proper amount of suffering for human sins. Are they saying that? That is classic penal substitution teaching. Did you like that view? And thus, they ultimately teach that God killed Christ on the cross. Yes, way in the back, Jennifer. Did we say that we have a extremely urgent need that to revisit what we we believe, and that belief um, needs to start from v- revisiting the character of God, and to make sure that what we believe is in line with that character. Seeing that there is so many views out there that is totally distorting his character, and hence leading us to believe in someone or, or views that are totally not God. Absolutely. Absolutely, this is critical. This is, this is the central issue. This is what the war began in heaven. Spread to earth. This is the final issue in the war between Christ and Satan. It's an issue of a question of God's law. Adventists have been duped into thinking the question over God's law is just which arbitrary rule are you keeping? Do you have the right day or don't have the right day? Rather than realizing days of the week that one worships on are just symbols, like a cross is a symbol, a pentagram is a symbol. They're symbols or signs. They are not the reality themselves. That's all. And if you don't understand the reality to which they point, then you can have the... I mean, can a person wear a cross around their neck and still be a Satanist? Okay, you can have the right sign and still be the, have the wrong heart. And many Adventists don't get this. And so, yes, it's critical that we come back to this. This is why our church is paralyzed. This is why the Christian world is paralyzed. This is why within Christianity, there is no power and victory over sin. And there's no difference in, as you've heard before, child abuse rates and and spouse abuse rates and pornography use and addictions in Christian homes and non-Christian homes. There's no difference in the rates. Because that system that that Satan has infected the world, it has no power. It's all a system of accountability of deeds rather than transformation of hearts. Russell. <laughs> Wouldn't this presentation of God's laws being uh, imposed in arbitrary have been the only, the only deception Satan could have used on the angels? Because if he, if he presented it as a natural law, but a uh, dysfunctional natural law, the angels would have rejected it. With perfect, perfect segue. Let's jump into Sunday's lesson. Sunday's lesson is about the fall in heaven. Yes. Before you go, continue with that. In that introduction, the last paragraph... Uh, The second sentence, the challenge has always been where we place our loyalties, on the side that won or on the side that was lost. No, that's not the ultimate challenge. The ultimate challenge is who you believe in and why. Exactly. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? So, jump to Sunday's lesson, which is the fall in heaven, the war in heaven that Russell was referencing. With our understanding of God's true law in mind, the design law that Russell was just mentioning, how did Satan get a third of the angels to rebel? How did he do it? 